we are headed into the peak of bird migration season, and this is a time of year when bird enthusiasts and even non bird enthusiasts get to relish in seeing those new species landing here and enjoying their sounds and sights first thing in the morning. Joining me now to talk about all of this is Dr. Benjamin Freeman with Georgia Tech School of Biology. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks, Melissa. So, of course, we talked about the spring migration, but now we're going to the time of year when these birds are headed back south somewhere warmer. Why do birds migrate and why does that why is that so unique in comparison to some other species? Yeah, well, what did what did you do this morning? What did I do this morning? We had our breakfast and so birds when it gets to be fall and they have less food to eat, they undertake these migrations. So it's, it's really about finding places that have the right food for them. So the birds that eat insects as it gets colder, they need to go somewhere warmer that will still have insects for them to eat. So where are a lot of the birds coming from and where are they going? Are there specific species that travel more through Georgia than others, or do you really get the whole gamut of everything? There's, there's, a, there's a whole whole mix of stuff. So anything that breeds and has their babies north of us uh, potentially is going to come down. So that there's a lot of species that are going to breed up in Canada in the boreal forest, and they're going to sweep down across the eastern uh, eastern U.S., pass through Georgia. A lot of them will be on their way down to the Caribbean or to Central and South America. That's where they'll spend the winter. Uh, and then there's other birds that are going to breed in the Appalachians, and they might come down, uh, and they might spend the whole winter with us in Georgia. So I guess the trigger mechanism for them knowing, hey, I need to start that travel south is the weather. So how does the weather play into how many birds we could see over North Georgia skies on any one given night? Are some weeks more favorable than others? Yeah, and it, it depends on it depends on the weather, like you're saying. So a cold cold snaps can can prompt birds to move. They might they might kind of hang out further north as long as it's warm, warm, warm. But it, cold, some a couple cold days come, and and they start flowing south. Um, and then it's it's also time of year. So like the birds get antsy, like they have an internal clock, and they they know that it's 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 time to be moving. And so they get antsy and then those weather cues come and they, they start moving down. And then especially nights that have the right atmospheric conditions, that have winds that are coming from north to south. And the birds then, sh they shoot up uh, and they use those winds, those favorable winds, their tail winds, uh, to help them as they fly south. And we have some of those winds coming through this weekend. When we reach peak migration season over north Georgia skies, how many birds on average can we see over the skies each and every night that might be just stopping through for a day or two? Yeah, it's it's we're talking about on the order of the human population of Georgia. So ballpark 10, 11 million is, is how many humans live in Georgia. That's about how many birds, uh, you know, pass through on a lot of these nights in, in September uh, and in, also in early October. And so some nights there'll be more, some nights there might be 15, 20 million, some nights there'll be less, um, but, but that's, that's kind of a ballpark of how many, how many birds are passing over, over our skies. And they're doing this as we sleep. Uh, most of these birds are migrating at night uh, and they're, they're, they're just coming up, they, they, they're doing their thing during the day, they're finding insects to eat, they're hanging out, it gets to be nighttime and they take off, they go up 3,000, 4,000, 5,000 feet up and then they're just flying all night long at 15 or 20 miles per hour headed south. And why is it that nighttime is that prime time for them to fly versus during the day when we think it's easier to drive on the road? Yeah, yeah, so there's the, I mean, they have these, they have these nocturnal highways and, and we think it's because uh, A, flying all night is hard work and they generate heat and it's cooler at night and it's also cooler higher up. And so we think they're finding places that are, are, are relatively cool. You don't want to run a marathon in the middle of the day in the full sun. And so these birds are finding conditions that, that are, are a little bit more pleasant thermally. There's also nothing trying to eat them. The hawks and things like that, they're sleeping. Uh, and, and, and the hawks that do migrate, migrate during the day. So these are the small birds. And so they're going up here at night. It's a safe time for them to, to be doing this very strenuous exertion. And when they come down during the day, Dr. Freeman, what are they doing? What type of habitat do they need to find the necessary food to get more fuel before another night of flying? 
Yeah, like you said, places with food, places with food. And those can be those can be, you know, wild places and wilderness places and state parks and national forests. Or it can be your backyard or your neighborhood park. Anything that has food for these birds. And you can kind of tell whether it's a place that is likely to have food for birds by the way it looks. If it's if it's just a grass lawn that's immaculately mowed, there's probably not much food around. But places with more shrubs and bushes, wet places, little marshes, uh, places next to streams, uh, these, these tend to be places that have a lot of insects that these birds can eat. And so a lot of those birds eat insects, but when we talk about hummingbirds, they need another type of food. Can you tell us about their timeline for passing over Georgia skies? And if people love to see hummingbirds, how can they get them to come back to their yard year after year? It's now, it's now, it's September. This is when hummingbirds are moving through. And these, these so we have, the, we have a species called the ruby-throated hummingbird. It has a ruby throat. The males have a ruby throat. The females have a, have a white throat. But it's this fantastic little bird. You know, it weighs four grams. It weighs like less than a nickel. Uh, and yet these, these little hummingbirds, they breed around us, but they also breed further north into Eastern North America. And all of them, whether they breed in Canada uh, or Georgia, are gonna come down pretty much and cross the Caribbean and spend the winter mainly in, in Mexico and Central America. And so September is the month when these hummingbirds are coming through. Uh, the, the, they're passing through our yards, they're passing through our neighborhoods, and they're stopping when they find nectar to, to eat. And so things like flowers, I know uh, we have some, some cardinal flowers and this like beautiful native red flower that we plant in the front. Sure enough, the last week we've had this, this, this lovely female hummingbird come, and she comes about every half hour to check and she drinks the nectar and she goes off and does it, probably goes to other flowers and comes back half an hour later when the plant has refilled the nectar. So there's either there's either plants that provide the nectar or you can put up a hummingbird feeder uh, and, and that would also attract hummingbirds uh, really nicely. I love how you were describing you watch the birds. What, what makes birds so special to you? Why do you enjoy studying them and learning more about them? I think it's wonderful to have a tether to the non-human world, right? Like our... We all have so much going on in, in our personal and professional lives. And, you know, it's, it's a complicated time to, to, to be human. And I think we get a lot out of just psychologically. I think it's, it's just like a deep breath to pay attention to the non-human world. And birds are, are a wonderful lens uh, through which to, to do that. Uh, you look out the window. Uh, and you can you can see birds. You you look out in your yard. You can see birds. You go for a walk in your neighborhood. You can see birds, um, and and I think they they really kind of uh, tell us what's happening in nature, like we're talking about right now. How these seasonal changes happen, uh, and and there's something very uh, kind of psychologically calming and pleasant about tapping into that. And part of your job at Georgia Tech is, of course, to teach, but also part of it is to do some research. Can you tell us a little bit about what your research group has been doing in the North Georgia mountains this summer? Exactly. So we're really interested in understanding why species live where they do and whether that's changing as climate changes. Uh, and so we went up to the North Georgia mountains and we did these surveys at 13 ridges across across North Georgia, really, a good panel of, of Georgia's high elevation uh, locations. Uh, and we did these surveys where students went out and stood in different places along these trails and counted which birds they heard or saw. Uh, and then we're gonna compare that to similar data from 15 years ago to see what's, what's changed. Uh, and and I'm, I'm, I'm curious to, to learn it. It's in some places we find some places researchers have found uh, that there haven't been many changes in other places. I study a lot of birds in tropical mountains where we find really strong changes. It gets warmer and birds move to higher and higher elevations. So I'm curious to, to learn what we find about what's been happening to, to North Georgia's mountain birds. And you were talking about your your research group. See, seeing different species of birds and hearing different species of birds. If somebody's a novel enthusiast, how can they learn this is the bird I see in my backyard or my neighborhood park or what I hear in the morning when I open the window and enjoy that cup of coffee? Is there any technology that's easy for them to get a hold of? Yes, yes, one word, Merlin. 
So there's this free app called Merlin, M-E-R-L-I-N, like the name of the wizard from King Arthur. It's also the name of a small falcon uh, a bird. It's, it's called a Merlin. So it's like this wizard app that will identify birds for you. It's free to download. It's easy to use. You hit record. If you're listening to a bird, you hit record on your phone, and the app will tell you with almost 100% accuracy what that bird is that you're hearing. It can do the same thing with photos uh, that you might be able to snap as well. It's just an astonishing thing and it, and it works really well. And I, I, I meet people out in parks that are, are using it and you don't have to know anything uh, in order to use it. And it's, just, it's a great way to just have a basically a friendly expert uh, in your pocket at all times. And I love free 99. That's, that's a great price tag to, to Can't beat the price citizen science. That's great. Any last words for folks to know as we head through the peak of bird migration season? Ah, I just think, yeah, keep, keep your eyes open and, and, and your, your ears uh, listening because there's it's, it's just a, such a fun season that, that things things are changing. Things are different. Um, you know, it, it might still we're going to have some, you know, days in the high 80s, low 90s, it's going to feel like summer to us, but the birds, they know that the, the season's changing. And so they're, they're, they're on the move. Uh, and so I think it's just a really fun time of year to, to pay attention to that and to notice what's, what's changing in nature as we move into fall. Dr. Benjamin Freeman, biologist with the Georgia, uh, Tech, Georgia Institute of Technology. Thank you so we, much. We for accept both. Today. We accept both. <laughs>